The Shattering War broke any hope that one of the demigods could rise to Elden Lord and repair the order of the world. Those few that do survive the Shattering War are broken, malformed, or simply unfit, pursuing mad schemes that will never come to fruition. The Greater Will has disowned these squabbling half-gods and bids us to take their heads in our quest to become Elden Lord. Yet there is one demigod who stands above the rest, one demigod who rose from the sewers to become the king of Leyndell itself. Morgoth, the Veiled Monarch, rules from the shadows, but when necessary will take to the field as his violent alter ego, Margit. Alongside his knight's cavalry, Margit the Fell has gained notoriety on the battlefield, hunting those who would seek the throne, hunting down champions with an almost demonic ferocity. There is no doubt that the only reason Leyendale still stands is because of the Veiled Monarch, a fascinating and complex character who has absolutely no reason to love Leyendale and its people, and yet has emerged as its greatest defender. But why did Morgoth not become Elden Lord? Why is he grace given? And why does he appear to be empowered by the formless mother in our final battle? I will attempt to answer such questions. And so in this lore video, we will be doing a full exploration of Morgoth, his origins, his rise to power, his incredible abilities, his omen blood, and what the formless mother has to do with the omen in general. At this stage, I would like to thank Mirko, translator for Subako no Meiko, and Loki, author of Abyssal Archive, for providing their translations and insights throughout this video. And before we get started guys, remember that if you like Elden Ring lore content, then consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. As I discussed in my Omen Curse video, which I will link below, the Omen are not their own species, rather they are humans afflicted with the Omen Curse, and Loki has been kind enough to provide translations and insights on this particular subject. On the original Japanese used for Omen, they had the following to say. Most Omen are an Omen child, which would typically refer to an unwanted kid, adjective meaning unlucky, abhorred, taboo, etc. These are unwanted and discarded children, children of both regular human variety and those who belong to the royal family, a fact illustrated by the Omen and Regal Omen Bairn. This curse afflicts all, no matter if they are royal or common. And the fate of being born an Omen is a tragedy, and in a way you are already considered dead, especially when you consider that these model bairns these stone carvings of omen children are based on the real life Jizu. These are stone statues that play a role in the practice of Mizuko Kuyo, or Water Child Memorial Service, in which Jizu are carved to memorialise a child who died as a result of miscarriage or other means. The implication of carving this for the omen is pretty telling. Being born an omen, you are already considered dead and indeed this does make sense when you consider the fate of an omen. If you are a commoner, you will likely die in the brutal force surgery of having your horns cut, and even if you do survive, you will be chained and sent to the front lines of war. If you are of royal blood, then your treatment is not much better. As we learn via the regal omen bairn, as a royal omen, you are spared the brutal horn surgery, but instead you are sent to the shunning grounds in secret, so no one even knows that you exist, and you may as well be dead. And so it is that the omen of royal lineage populate the subterranean shunning grounds. This would be the fate of the twin brothers Moog and Morgoth, who we know are twins thanks to Moog's great rune. While the other royal omen found in the sewers may be connected to royalty as distant descendants or minor nobility, Moog and Morgoth are specifically of the Golden Order, of the Royal Family. As Morgoth's Great Rune reads, This Great Rune is the anchor ring that houses the base and proves two things, that the Omen King was born of the Golden Lineage 
and that he was indeed the Lord of Dale. And indeed it is heavily implied that they aren't just distant descendants of Godfrey and Marika, rather they are direct offspring of Marika and Godfrey, given the recognition that Godfrey has for Morgot, who he hasn't seen for a long time. It's been a long while, Morgot. Perhaps it was their importance, that potential embarrassment that they could cause to the royal family itself that led to both Morgot and Moog to be shackled as an extra measure by magical fetishes. As we learn from the items themselves, these are special precautions for Margit and Moog in particular. However, there is a nuance about Moog and Morgoth's early life that I have always wondered, and that is, were they immediately placed here the moment they were born in the Shunning Grounds? Or did they once live amongst Godfrey and the other royals before they were persecuted? The fact that Morgoth's remembrance can be used to create the Regal Omen Bairn suggests that this was a bairn carved for him in particular, implying that he was a child when he was placed below ground, as this child statue is meant to memorialise him. However, let me offer an alternative, more nuanced theory, and a theory it is nonetheless, so bear that in mind, that Morgoth spent some of his early childhood in the capital before being placed below ground when the persecution of the omen began. For example, I find it interesting that Godfrey has a reverential treatment of his son, that there is some kind of relationship there, a bond that wouldn't feel as meaningful if they hadn't had time to build up a relationship, without Morgoth having once existed above ground as a normal royal child. There's also the Godfrey Phantom that we fight on our way to meet Morgoth. This phantom uses the same crucible emblem when it is summoned as the market projections in Altus Plateau. They both share the same symbol for crucible miracles, and given Morgoth's clear use of golden miracles, such as his weapons and the market manifestations, I think it is easy for us to conclude that Morgoth summoned this Godfrey phantom as one final barrier between us and the Elden Throne. And so if we accept that this phantom is something conjured by Morgoth, how is he able to do so if he had no memories of his father? If he was placed in the sewers immediately upon being born, he wouldn't even know his father's face. Do you remember anything from your early infancy? I reckon it would be hard for him to form a Godfrey Spectre that moves and fights exactly like his father had he not spent some time with Godfrey a feat that would have been very difficult for someone placed in the sewers upon his infancy. Aside from this, Morgoth and Moog are extremely intelligent and well-spoken, something I would imagine would be hard to develop had they lived their entire lives underground in a sewer. Indeed, the other regal omen we find in the Shunning Grounds seem far more bestial than Moog and Morgoth, and I would have expected the twins to be similar had they lived their entire lives in this sewer. And so, if the omen are so hated and reviled, how would my speculative theory be possible? Well, we have to remember that while the omen are the omen now, despised and reviled, at one stage their forms were seen as the opposite, as divine. We learn of the divine nature of their forms via the not talisman, an item dropped by an omen killer no less, and is no doubt a reference to the bony knots that form the base of omen horns. In the time of the crucible, such vestigial growths, like those seen on the omen and the misbegotten, were seen as divine, which makes sense given they were touched by the crucible, which at that stage was the centre of worship, not the Erd Tree. It was only as civilization advanced in the time of the Erd Tree that the omen would become disdained, as the ideas of refinement and geniality became the ideal, stark contrast to the forms of the omen. If the omen were accepted in the Crucible era, the era that immediately preceded the time of the Erd Tree, there must have been a period of overlap, where they were still accepted in the early age of Leandell, 
I think we see this transformation through Godfrey himself, who vowed to conduct himself as a lord in keeping with the new ideas of civilization, a transition from a bloodthirsty warrior of the crucible to a noble and defined lord of the age of the Erd Tree. Such ideas do not happen overnight, we are talking about the evolution of a society's morals and ideals, after all. The Crucible Knights themselves may well help indicate how long it took for these new ideals to emerge. The Crucible Knights were once the greatest heroes of the ruling order's armies. However, as the Erdtree ideas of civilization and geniality advanced, their time would come too. As the Crucible Gauntlets read, In time, the strength shown by these knights and even their appearance was seen as chaotic and deserving of scorn. In time, suggesting that over time there was an overlap where ideals of the crucible were still held, but in time these were pushed to the fringes, to the extreme point where crucible knights themselves were actually deserving of scorn. And the reason that the crucible knights are hated is mainly the reason that the omen are hated as well. If you replace the word knights with omen in the crucible gauntlets, it could definitely apply to the omen and the changing ideals around them. My point is, is that surely the omen were not immediately slapped in chains the moment the Erd Tree emerged. Rome was not built in a day and we can assume that the ideals of the crucible will have overlapped into the early times of the Erd Tree and certainly in the early reign of Godfrey and Marca when Morgoth and Moog were likely born. And if Morgoth lived as a child in the early age of the Erdtree, it would provide him with an opportunity for him to gain a love for it. His remembrance makes it clear that his love for the Erdtree is one of his defining features. And I think it's more likely that he would have developed a love for the Erdtree had he lived in early Erdtree society amongst people who worshipped its glory. Aside from all this speculation, we can look at the archaeological evidence, so to speak, of the Shunning Grounds themselves. The Shunning Grounds are basically the sewers of Leyendel, rather than a purpose-made prison. This suggests that the sewers, and thus the city of Leyendel, must have been in existence when the Omen were first imprisoned, that Leyendel precedes the subjugation of the Omen. Because surely if the omen had been hated while Leyendale was being built or before it was built, there would have been a purpose made prison for them. Instead, the picture that is painted, in my opinion, is that this city and culture developed without the hatred for the omen, and it was something that came about later, and thus the regal omen were hastily thrown into the sewers, a makeshift prison for a city that had long been built years ago. With all that speculation said, Morgoth is the Veiled Monarch, and few know of his and Moog's true identity. Ofnir describes Moog as the one only known as the Lord of Blood. And so if my theory is correct, then they wouldn't have lived long on the surface, otherwise everyone would know who they are. Ultimately, this is all just speculation on my part, and Moog and Morgoth may very well have been placed in the underground as a child much like the rest of the regal omen, and the very fact few know their identities would certainly support this view, and I do leave it up to you to decide your own narrative, whether they were placed in here as newborns, or if they lived some kind of life on the surface before their imprisonment. The greatest lore item in the game, the Albanoric Blood Clot, tells us that any life form that was not touched by the Erd Tree's grace is seen as impure and the omen would certainly fall under that category. The remembrance of the omen king reinforces the omen's disconnect from the world of grace by calling the omen graceless, and one only need see the treatment of the albanorics and the tarnished to see what being graceless will earn you in the Erdtree era. I've already covered in depth the nature of the omen curse in my omen curse lore video, and this video is more a profile piece on Morgoth himself, so if you are interested on the omen condition and its nuances, I would recommend that video which I will link below. But in that video we highlighted the actions of the Dung Eater, 
who spreads the curse that is connected to the omen condition, and his quest and his actions are great at illustrating why the omen are seen as graceless. The seedbed that is cultivated on the corpses of those he defiles tells us that to be cursed, to be connected to the fell curse of the omen, is to be denied returning to the Erd Tree upon death, again reinforcing the omen's graceless nature and how they fall outside the current system. This of course gives greater significance to the title, Grace Given, that Morgoth would earn in time through his defence of the Erd Tree and the world of grace, despite his graceless birthright. With no cure, the omen were either hunted, forced into a brutal life-threatening surgery, or thrown away into the shunning grounds, out of sight, out of mind, and never to be remembered. And it is to the dark, damp depths of the shunning grounds that we turn to next. So it is in these dark, dank tunnels that Morgoth and Moog would spend a good portion of their life, despite their regal heritage. Their jailers would even go as far to shackle these too, and this makes sense given their power and intelligence, it would be easy for them to escape. There are a couple of interesting lore nuggets found in these shackles, so let us read the description of Margit's shackle now, which reads, A fetish bathed in golden magic. Shackles were used to bind the accursed people, called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under the strictest confinement. Though faint, the shackles still retain vestiges of power, enough to trap the once bound Margit on Earth, if only for a short time. So these shackles aren't made of metal or chains, rather it is a magical fetish imbued with golden magic, which makes sense given it is the Order of Grace who has imprisoned them. What I also find interesting is that the emblem manifested when we activate the shackle ourselves takes the form of a tree symbol that is something between the crucible symbol and the Erd tree symbol, and as far as I can see it, this could mean two different things. One, it is a crucible-esque symbol that is meant to denote the omen specifically. Number two, the omen were imprisoned in the early era of the Erd Tree, and the magic dates from this period, and this symbol is representative of that period, predating both the Erd Tree and Golden Order magical emblems. What's interesting is that the way the emblem appears when we use the shackle is very similar to the projections that happen when Margit and the Godfrey Phantom appear at certain locations throughout the Lands Between as I've already discussed in the previous chapter. This suggests to me that the source of Morgoth's power and his ability to project his Margit persona and to summon this Godfrey Phantom is also a form of golden magic, as this is what's described in Margit's Shackle. And so it's a very useful lore item as it simultaneously provides an insight into what Morgoth's powers actually are. Returning to the subject at hand, it is brutal to think of these two brothers scratching out a living here. The Shunning Grounds themselves clearly aren't a purpose-made creche for the Omen. These are the sewers of Leyendel, a real sign of how little regard is given to the Omen people. They are considered no better than waste, than the rats that share the tunnels with them, and compounded with the issues that the Omen condition brings, this is a horrifying existence for anyone. We could get further insight into how little regard the World of Grace have for the Omen through a cut NPC known as Viscount Shanehite. This Viscount would have been a noble in Altus Plateau and would have given us quests that related to the extermination of the Omen so he could get an audience with the Veiled Monarch, who he doesn't know to be an Omen. Viscount Shanehite represents all the haughtiness of the World of Grace and how they look down on those who are without grace, like the Tarnished and the Omen. Before we discuss the relevant dialogue, the usual warning for cut content applies here. Cut content is not to be considered canon, rather it can be used to see the intention behind certain areas of lore throughout development, especially where it doesn't clash with what's currently in the game. In this case, I feel the cut content does fit nicely with what we know in the lore 
as it is in game. And so I think we can safely consider it in our analysis of the omen. However, do take it with a pinch of salt. And this warning does apply for all the times I will mention the Viscount throughout this video. So he would have said the following on the regal omen found in the Shunning Grounds. The undercapital is a repository of waste. For ages it's teemed with repulsive omen. Fiendlings even, who have never lost a horn. And what's worse, they've taken to bellowing in a most blood-curdling manner. You can hear it all the way up here. A vile, ceaseless affront to the Erdtree's sanctity. So even before we got this dialogue, it is heavily implied that those of grace see the omen as lesser and even vile beings. But here it is from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Interestingly, he also mentions how the omen bellow. And while this is an irritation to the haughty Viscount, it is of course a testament to the horrendous conditions that the omen find themselves in. These bellows are one of pain and suffering. We can get an insight on how the omen condition itself and the afflictions associated with it would have compounded how horrendous these years would have been for the twins via the cursed blood pot, which reads as follows. Throw at enemies to douse them in accursed blood, causing summoned spirits to assail them with rabid fervour. A childhood memory of the Lord of Blood. Now the accursed blood contained within this pot is obviously omen blood, as omen blood is referred to interchangeably with the term accursed, such as in Morgoth's sword. Now if you've never used one of these cursed blood pots, what it actually does in game is essentially paint a target for your ash spirit summons. So if you hit a target with this pot, all of your summons eyes will go red and they will all aggressively attack that particular enemy. So we can see that the omen blood, the accursed blood in the pot, sends restless spirits into a frenzy. And this reminds us of the description of the omen smirk mask. Two item descriptions relating to the omen and two mentions of spirits. It is obviously connected. Clearly these spirits never let the omen rest even for a minute. Moog has memories of being pursued by said spirits because of his omen blood, and the omen smart mask tells us that the omen are haunted in their dreams by these very spirits, and indeed we do see the omen having fitful sleeps in the few occasions that they are asleep in the lands between. And given Moog and Morgoth are of the omen condition, we can safely assume that the twins suffered these same afflictions and that Morgoth will have experienced what Moog did in his childhood memories. In my Omen Curse lore video, I suggested that these spirits, mentioned by the Omen Smart Mask, are those that have died while afflicted with the Fell Curse. We have already seen, through the Seedbed Curse and the actions of the Dung Eater, that those who are touched by the curse are unable to return to the Erd Tree, suggesting a state of restlessness. But more importantly, there is the evidence provided by the Wraith Callers, who use a brown-black projectile that is identical to the brown-black projectiles used by the Omen, including by Morgoth himself in the final stages of his battle. The item that these Wraith Callers use to manipulate these projectiles is the Wraith Caller Bell, and the Wraith Caller Bell describes these projectiles as Wraiths of those who have died cursed, and given the omen can also manipulate these same powers, powers that are also unleashed by the omen bairns, it is a fair conclusion that these wraiths are those who die from the omen curse, and they are connected to the omen, who can manipulate them freely without the use of a wraith collar bell. The connection between these cursed spirits and the omen condition is reinforced by the description of this cursed blood pot. It works specifically by spilling a cursed blood, omen blood, on the victim, and then the spirits are drawn to the victim like a moth to a flame, as if they believe the victim is of omen blood. This tells us so much about the relationship between the cursed spirits and the omen, though admittedly the cursed blood pot manipulates different spirits from the wraiths 
of the Wraith Collar Bell and the Omen type magic, in this case the Accursed Blood affects those spirits that still dwell in Ash, but in a way these Ashen spirits are in the same position as the Wraiths described by the Wraith Collar Bell anyway. They are restless spirits unreturned to the Erd Tree, and so the Cursed Blood Pot suggests the Omen and the Omen Blood has a connection to all restless spirits, that it angers them, as if the Omen are to blame for their restless condition. But that is just my speculation of course. And it reinforces the idea that the Omen are connected intrinsically to the spirits of the Cursed, down to their very blood, and that those of Omen Blood must be surrounded by these spirits and haunted by them every waking minute and every sleeping minute as well. This paints a pretty grim picture of the tormented existence of being an omen, and the regal omen that we find in the sewers are little more than rabid beasts, having known no better than this rancid mire and being driven mad by the spirits. This traumatising experience, years of being locked in a sewer by your own kind, and then being haunted by the spirits every moment of every day, is what made the twins what they are in this current age, and it is more understandable therefore the hang ups that both of these extreme characters have. The incredible resolve and strength they would have to overcome these burdens, the burdens of being cursed while simultaneously being shackled in a sewer, is absolutely incredible and it is therefore no surprise that both of them cling to pretty extreme ideals, but it is no doubt clinging to these ideals that have allowed them to rise above their preordained fate and become something much more, real forces to be reckoned with that stand high amongst the other demigods. And it is clear that Moog and Morgoth are two of the most powerful demigods in existence, and while the Omen Curse may have affected them psychologically, it is clear that the omen form does come with a lot of powers, both physical and otherwise. We learn via the Blood Boon incantation that Moog would eventually accept his omen condition and in fact revel in it. After communion with the formless mother, spitting at the golden order by learning to love his accursed blood and turning away from their teachings. In fact he would go on and build a dynasty, connected by his accursed blood. I do have a complete video on Moog Lord of Blood and so if you are interested in a deep analysis of his story, I would recommend that video. However the reason for me highlighting Moog's ultimate revelation here in this video is to highlight the dichotomy of their characters, because it is no surprise, as we have discussed, that both characters became extremists to deal with their condition and their upbringing. It's just that they both went in completely opposite directions, two extreme ends of the same spectrum. And as far as I could see it, there are three ways that the twins could have gone. One, they could have been completely broken, becoming a gibbering beast, broken by their condition and by their strict confinement. Then there was the second reaction which is what Moog had, essentially a rebellion of everything they had been taught where he rejected the condemnation of his jailers, accepted what he was and made it his strength and built a dynasty upon it, admittedly while being helped along by a powerful outer god. Then there was the third option and this is the option that Morgoth chose, where he embraced the ideals of his abusers, that the world of grace was divine and he was graceless, and instead of hating them for it, he accepted it and made it his priority to defend what he believed to be divine, even if that meant accepting that he was lesser. Yet in Morgoth's mind, upon accepting that, he evidently didn't believe that he should be in prison forever, that in fact he had a lot to give to the world of grace, and that by proving his value, valour and strength to the world of grace, he could become grace given, despite his very nature. And this is the confusing and fascinating dichotomy of Morgoth, that while he sees his flesh, his blood as lesser, he is still very proud and does clearly see himself as the most worthy to lead the world of grace and those of Leyendel following the shattering, proudly calling himself 
last of all kings. So while this may seem like a sort of Stockholm Syndrome at first, and there is certainly an element of that to it, there is a nuance to his character. Physically, Morgoth hated himself, and shared the utter disgust for his blood that the world of Grace did. And this is evidenced in the second stage of his fight with us, when the pressures of the fight lead him to release his omen blood all over the thrones of the demigods. The thrones, stained by my curse, such shame I cannot bear. Thy part in this shall not be forgiven. We have already seen how omen blood seems to be core of who the omen are. They are intrinsically linked to the spirits that haunt them through their blood. They are linked to the curse through their blood. And if Morgoth kills us in the second stage of his fight, he spitefully hopes that his omen blood will seep into our body, again reinforcing its connection to the curse. And these ideas will only be reinforced when we look at the formless mother in the final chapter. And so it makes a bit more sense the actions that Morgoth took in regards to his blood. And we learn of this via his cursed sword item description, which reads, Warped blade of shifting hue, used by Morgoth the Omen King. The accursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away reformed into this blade. So not only does the blade make a deadly weapon that he can use in Extremis, but it's almost as if it makes Morgoth feel better that less of his Omen blood is in his body, that by draining it out of his body and into this blade, he is lessening the curse within him. He is lessening his despised form. And just a quick side note on the shifting hue of the blade. Hawkshaw did a really great video on the colours found in Elden Ring and I highly recommend you check that out. In that video he describes how each colour within Elden Ring is assigned to a different theme. And as such, the shifting hue of Morgoth's blade to me is a reflection of the omen's connection to the Crucible. The Erdtree era, the Age of Grace, is an age of refinement and regression, whereas the Crucible was an age of chaotic vital energies that were all blended together, and in Morgoth's Blade we see all colours blended together. That's just my two cents. In short, Morgoth has learned to accept the Older of Gold's view on his condition, that he is impure, that he is graceless, and rather rebelling against such a notion like Moog, he instead sees it as an obstacle to be overcome, and it doesn't stop him from being as prideful as any other king, and he clearly sees himself as the right man to lead the world of grace. Despite his condition, he is the most worthy, and he certainly isn't paralysed by his self-hate. And so with that said, it's time to move the narrative forward, and let's talk about Morgoth's rise to power, from sewers to kingship. There is of course no direct mention of when Moog or Morgoth were able to escape their confinement of the Shunning Grounds, but clearly they did, as they are no longer there and in fact are pursuing their own agendas on the surface. But I think we can make a fairly obvious educated guess that it most likely happened following the destruction of the Earth Tree and the subsequent collapse of the Golden Order. With the destruction of this powerful artifact, both Marika and Radigan are gravely wounded. As we see from the story trailer, their body actually shatters as the Elden Ring is shattered, and we see the proof of this when we finally meet Marika Radigan in the finale when their bodies are completely ravaged. Then as we hear from the Two Fingers themselves, Marika was imprisoned following this rebellious act, the act of shattering the Elden Ring against the Greater Will's wishes. Queen Marika is the vessel of the Elden Ring, carrier of its vision, a god in truth. But after the Elden Ring's shattering, she was imprisoned in the Erd Tree, a grim punishment for shattering the Order. Despite her godhood, the fingers speak. 
Malika's trespass demanded a heavy sentence. But even in shackles, she remains a god and a vision's vessel. And given Radigan shares a body with Marika, he too is obviously left to languish within the Erd Tree. In a single stroke, the Elden Ring, root of the Golden Order, was shattered, and the Elden Lord and God vanished. At the beginning of the game, in the introduction, it is specifically mentioned that Queen Marika has not been seen since the Elden Ring was shattered. Nobody in the world at large knows that she's been imprisoned. To them, in their eyes, she has just simply vanished alongside the Elden Ring's destruction. And this, of course, would leave chaos and confusion in the wake of this event. The Golden Order has been destroyed, and the command structure failed in one fell swoop. And so I think it is most likely that this is the time that Moog and Morgoth would have escaped their captivity, though admittedly Moog may have done so earlier with the help of the Formless Mother. But for Morgoth at least, the chaos afforded by the collapse of the political structure that kept him confined is obviously the most likely opportunity that he would have to escape. The narrative that I suggest is this. With the collapse of any sort of command structure, Morgoth rose from the Shunning Grounds and claimed kingship over Dell. After all, he does have a legitimate claim to the throne. As I'll remind you, his great rune states that he is of the Golden Lineage. He is of royal blood, and therefore has a claim to the throne. The fact that Morgoth claims that he is the last of all kings... Have it writ upon thy meager grave. Felled by King Morgoth. Last of all kings really emphasises that he is using his royal lineage as a legitimacy for his claim to the throne, and by implication, is implying his authority over the other demigods as well, which would certainly no doubt play a factor in how he sees them all as willful traitors later on. In my own speculation, I imagine Morgoth taking command of Leandell in a time of great calamity and confusion, and his position as king as well as his legitimate claim, will no doubt have steadied the nerves of those who lived in the lands of Leandell. Indeed, Morgoth clearly had a keen mind and sought to prevent any further calamities, and is responsible for the sentry torches. These read, Torch given to protectors of the Earth Tree. Its flames are bestowed with a special incantation which allows the bearer to see assassins cloaked in veils furnished on behalf of the Erd Tree and the grace-given Lord, such that a Knight of the Black Knives will never come again. Clearly, Morgoth identified the massive role that the Knight of the Black Knives played in the Golden Order's eventual fall, as well as the damage it did to the lands between. And now that he is king, he would not want to fall victim to such an assassination, and already he is proving himself to be an effective defender of the lands of Leandell and the Erd Tree. When it comes to the shattering itself, the general narrative that we get from the intro cinematics, NPCs and the story trailer is that the Elden Ring was shattered and then there was the Shattering War. However, I believe this glosses over the build-up to said war, and we do get some minor evidence that a new order briefly rose up to maintain a some kind of peace in the wake of the Golden Order's collapse the Sovereign Alliance. We learn of this body via the sword monument found in Altus Plateau, and it reads as follows. The first defence of Leandell, a Sovereign Alliance rots from within. Traces yet remain of a bloody conspiracy. What of course follows will be my own speculation, but I take this statement to mean that there was an alliance. An alliance that kept the peace, until some of its members betrayed what it stood for and it led to the first defence of Leandell and the shattering that followed. Who could have had the will to bring together such a tenuous alliance? Who would care enough to try for peace? And who do we know to be a sovereign? A king? I believe the mastermind behind this alliance to be Morgoth, as Morgoth's actions throughout the game show us he is interested in one thing, 
the preservation in the Erd Tree and the lands of Leyendale, and thus preserving peace between the demigods would certainly be in line with this aim. And really, none of the other demigods have such a motive for setting up an alliance like this. Like the other demigods, Morgoth would claim a shard of the shattered Elden Ring, claim the throne, and according to my own fevered speculation, would form this sovereign alliance to oversee a period of shaky peace. And while we don't get any direct mention of who the members of this alliance could be, I feel it lines up nicely with the thrones that we find before Morgoth's fight and the demigods that he assigns to each throne. What is thy business with these thrones? Ah, Godric the Golden. The twin prodigies, Mikola and Melania. General Radan. Praetor Reichard. Luna Princess Rani. Willful traitors. All. What else could this arrangement of thrones be other than a council that once stood between all of the demigods before the shattering? It could be the Sovereign Alliance. I do believe that the members named here, those who sat on the thrones, once comprised the Sovereign Alliance beside Morgoth. To compound this idea, Morgoth calls them traitors and pillagers, and if they are traitors, Surely that means they betrayed some sort of oath, or agreement, or loyalty, to pursue their own quest of power. Perhaps they are traitors because they broke from their sovereign alliance to pursue their own selfish bid for power that resulted in the Shattering War. Viscount Shanehite would have had a dialogue that would really have reinforced this exact narrative that I am suggesting, as he would have said the following regarding the Shattering War. The Shattering caused a great many fools to overstep their bounds. Their impudence led to insurgency against Morgoth, Lord of Grace. They raised an army and sought to lay siege to this sacred ground. The language used here is very revealing, and very much in line with Morgoth's traitor speech. There is talk of an insurgency. If the insurgency was against Morgoth, then that surely means that the perpetrators owed him some sort of allegiance. And again, I believe the Sovereign Alliance was convened by Morgoth after he claimed kingship, and this brings new meaning to his traitors dialogue. They aren't just traitors to the Erd Tree and the World of Grace, they are traitors to Morgoth himself, as in regards to lineage, Morgoth is the rightful heir to the throne. There is also evidence that Godric once lived in Leyendel, which would obviously suggest that he was aligned with Morgoth. Godric is named to have one of the thrones, meaning as Godric the Golden, he once sat in this council. And at the end of his fight with us, he says the following. I am the lord of all that is golden, and one day we'll return together to our home, bathed in rays of gold. Godric wants to return to Leyendel, and while this could be a general statement about his golden lineage, it's clear he was once here, as we learn that he was actually driven from Leyendel, thanks to a dialogue from the great Kenneth Height, who says the following. Honestly, Godric's nothing more than a jumped up country bumpkin. Lord, oh, don't make me laugh. First, he hid himself amongst the women folk to flee the capital, then hid from Radan in that castle. The first defence of Leyendale also involved Godric's kinsman, specifically Godefroy. Godefroy is now in an Everjail, and we learn that he was captured during this first defence. As Dragon Knight Kristoff's ashes read, After the first defence of Leyendale, Kristoff earned the hero's honour of Erdtree burial for the feat of capturing Godefroy the Grafted. As such, I feel that Godric and his family was driven from the capital as a result of him and his relatives 
betraying the Pact of the Sovereign Alliance and laying siege to Leyendel in the first defence of Leyendel. We clearly see from Godric's dialogues that he believes he is the true heir to Leyendel, that he is the last of the Golden Lineage, and as such, he'll have certainly taken umbrage at the Omen King seizing what he saw to be his rightful throne. Whatever way it played out, the crumbling of the Sovereign Alliance led to the shattering, and any hope for peace was diminished. And in the ensuing years, Morgoth would become one of the most important figures in the entire war, successfully defending Leyendel from all besiegers. But why does Morgoth take it upon himself to defend the Erdtree? Why doesn't he take the Elden Throne and repair the Elden Ring as the Greater Well clearly desires? I think that we get a little bit of an insight into his viewpoint on things when we speak to him as he dies. Tarnished, thou art but a fool. The Erd Tree wards off all who deign approach. We are, we are all forsaken. <laughs> None may claim the title of Elder and Lord. Thy deeds shall be met with failure, just as I. <sighs> he says that the Erd Tree wards off all who deign approach, and I suggest that he has interpreted the ceiling of the Erd Tree as the well of the Erd Tree or the well of the Greater Well. This is why he sees those who are trying to claim the Elden Throne as nothing more than pillagers. He believes that this is against what the Greater Well and the Erd Tree want. He uses the term, we are all forsaken. And this suggests that he believes that the Greater Well and the Erd Tree have forsaken everyone in the world. There is no plan to repair the Elden Ring, and in Morgoth's remembrance, it is said he loves the Erd Tree, and thus the only thing left for him to do is to protect the thing he loves in a world where he believes that we are forsaken and there is no way forward. There is no one more loyal to the Erd Tree or the Greater Well than Morgoth. But surely if he was truly loyal, he would be encouraging someone to take the Elden Throne, much as the Two Fingers are, or he would take it himself. As the dialogue from Aeneas suggests following our own failure to enter the Erd Tree, we know that the ceiling of the Erd Tree is not the will of the Greater Will, as the Two Fingers are confused as to what to do next. This wasn't the plan. You know what this means. The Erd Tree has burned you. The fingers remain still, shaken by this turn of events. They are busy consulting the greater will. The confusion over the ceiling of the Erd Tree is of course answered by the visual evidence, as we know it is Radigan who is responsible for the Barrier of Thorns, as it is Radigan's mark that seals the Barrier of Thorns. Radigan has sealed the Erd Tree to prevent his Shattered Order from being supplanted, and he is the only one that benefits from us being denied access to the Elden Ring. In my opinion, this is not the first time that Radigan has tricked a major player into defending his plans and his schemes. At the end of Gideon Ofnir's quest, he suggests that Marka doesn't want anyone to take the throne, and that we are to struggle for eternity. In her mind, and as a result, he risks his life by standing between us and our ultimate aim. According to Ofnir's armour, he appears to have had some contact with what he believes to be the will of Marika, which is of course where his opinion on what Queen Marika wants comes from. Yet we get direct contradictory evidence that this is not what Marika wants. She wants it to end, she wants someone to ascend the Elden Throne and kill the Elden Beast, and the main source of evidence for this is Hugh. We know from Hugh's dialogue that you can hear when he is praying to himself that it was Queen Marika that placed him here, and it was she that commanded him to forge a weapon capable of killing a god. Oh, your divinity have mercy and grant me forgiveness. The 
road is yet long. A god is not easily felled. But one day without fail, you will have your wish. So please grant me forgiveness, Queen Marika. No, 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 no. I need to do better than this. This will never kill a god. I can do better than this. It needs to slay a bloody god. Why would she do this if what Ulfnir claims is true? Well, the obvious answer to that is it's not. Who is the only person that benefits from people eternally struggling and no one reaching the Elden Ring? It's Radigan, and it ties up with his actions in putting up the Barrier of Thorns. He doesn't want his shattered order to be supplanted, no matter how broken things are, and so he puts the Barrier of Thorns. And when Radigan connects to Ofnir, he convinces Ofnir that he is his god, Queen Marka. And given that Radigan is the other persona of Queen Marka, it isn't hard to see that Ofnir wouldn't know the difference. And so I likewise believe that Morgoth has unwittingly become a pawn in Radigan's aims. Morgoth has mistaken Radigan's barring of the Erdtree as the will of the Erdtree itself. And this is why he so fervently defends it, and while claiming to be an adherent of the Erdtree and the World of Grace, he actually stands in the way of order being repaired. There is of course the other idea that he is being guided by the Greater Will and Grace, and that his role is a part of the Greater Plan, that he is a crucible or a test for a worthy lord, but we will touch on that at the end of this video. Regardless of his reasons, Morgoth stands directly in the way of anyone who would want to stand before the Elden Ring, and infuriated by the betrayal of the other demigods, who he sees as nothing more than opportunistic pillagers, he takes actions that will ensure the safety and defence of Laendale and the Erdtree. But these violent times demanded more than his incredible intelligence. He would need to bring his ferocious power to bear, and as such, Morgoth would take on a new persona, Margot the Fell. And so in this next chapter, let us examine the two aspects of Morgoth, the Veiled Monarch and the Fell Omen. Some may question why Margot, as a persona, even needs to exist. And at the time of Elden Ring's release, there was a lot of confusion about Margot and Morgoth, and whether or not they are the same character. Of course, in time this would be proven to be the case, due to Margit's shackle working on Morgoth and Margit, and the fact that the Margit projection at Stormvale would disappear if he defeated Morgoth first. However, as I'm sure many are aware, Viscount Shanehight, who we've mentioned a couple of times before, would have added more flavour to this dichotomy, and would have explained more directly why the Margit alias needed to exist. As I mentioned earlier, Viscount Shanehite represents the worst of the world of grace, really emphasising all their prejudices and hatred, seeing himself as a person of grace far above the tarnished and the omen. For example, in his dialogue with us, he would have said the following. All things have their proper place. We, having been chosen by grace, were given this golden capital. You, on the other hand, have your own home, which is a far cry from here so far in fact, that it cannot be further marred by your touch. We of course see this type of disdain to a lesser degree with Kenneth Height, but at least he is able to see past his prejudices and work with the tarnished, and in time warms to them. Conversely, Viscount Shane Height seems to be very sure of his superiority. As we have already seen, his greatest hatred is reserved for the Omen, and he basically sees the Omen as no better than filth to offend the purity of his world of grace, and as a result he would have commissioned us, the Tarnished, to clear out the omen found in the Shunning Grounds. His motivation for doing so is not only because he hates the omen and sees them as vermin, but because he thinks it will please who he sees as the pinnacle of the world of grace, King Morgoth, and upon us completing this mission for him, he would have requested an audience with King Morgoth so he could share his great victory over the Omen with the Lord of Grace and receive his favour as a result. Of course, the entire irony of this quest 
is that Shane Height would not have realised that his king, who he holds up as the pinnacle of grace, was an omen himself. At the end of his quest, after his much sought audience, Shane Height's world is turned upside down when he realises that Morgoth is an omen, and he asks us to kill him. Unable to see past his lord's omen form, despite all Morgoth has done for Laendel, feats that Shane Height himself bragged to us about in earlier dialogues. But all that Morgoth has done for Laendel doesn't matter to people like Shane Height, because Morgoth is a graceless omen, he is only deserving of scorn. And while this quest isn't the game, it again gives intention to the title that Ofnir gives Morgoth, the Veiled Monarch. Nobody knows who Morgoth actually is physically. They know he is the legitimate king of Laendel and that he acts in their defence, but they do not know he is an omen, because he knows that the World of Grace would not accept him as the rightful liege. And this is why Marga is necessary. When the shattering broke out and Morgoth's vision of unity fell apart, he only had one goal in mind, protect the Elden Ring and the Erd Tree from these pillagers. Margit offered Morgoth the ability to wield his considerable martial prowess and powers without revealing that Morgoth was an omen king to his subjects. But Morgoth doesn't just take to the field and call himself Margit, there's actually quite a lot of interesting character to the fell omen. He takes the opportunity to channel his hatred into this role and embraces his omen strength openly referring to himself as the Fell Omen. This is his chance to embrace his more omen side, and use its considerable physical advantages for his aims. It appears as though he first introduced his persona to the world during the second defence of Laendel, which we learn about via a sword monument found in the battlefields of Laendel. It reads as follows. The second defence of Laendel, the fell omen stacks high the corpses of heroes, yet the Erd Tree remains unshaken. The second defence of Laendel, where the city was evidently successfully defended from one of the demigods, and Margit personally took to the field and reaped a bloody toll, playing a significant part in the successful defence of the city. Who Margit battled in this fight is up for debate, but I do believe that the second defence of Laendel is the one that's shown in the opening cinematic, and I specifically analysed this slide in a previous lore video, which I will link below. I personally believe that Margit clashed with Radan in this battle, and I think that is what is shown here in this opening slide, as it is clearly very close to Radan's armour. And I'm not saying he physically overpowered Radan before anyone gets mad, but rather it is just an illustrative piece that shows that he clashed with Radan and that the second defence of Laendel was of course a victory for Margit. Indeed I could be wrong saying that this is Radan, rather it could be one of Radan's knights, or perhaps even Rykard pre-snake transformation. But regardless if it was one or multiple of the demigods who invaded Laendel, it's clear that Margit made a mark, and made a name for himself, personally slaying a lot of enemy soldiers, and his forces won the day as of course, Laendel still stands. The picture painted of Margit in the sword monument is pretty bloody, stacking high the corpses of heroes. It makes him seem like a true horror. The fear and horror that Margit inspired cannot be overstated, and is reinforced via the fell omen cloak, which reads as follows. Having slaughtered countless champions during the shattering, the fell omen has become a horror to those who harbour ambitions for the Erd Tree or for lordship. The fell omen isn't just a warrior, he has become a nightmare, a spectre for those who harbour ambition, for those who want lordship or the Erd Tree, and the fell omen will mercilessly hunt those who harbour such ambition, and he will do so at will, appearing wherever he needs to be, and hunt them again and again. What is interesting is that the original Japanese reflects this almost mythological reputation. Loki was kind enough to offer a translation and their perspective on how Margit is presented in the kanji, and I quote them now. 
Most omen are an omen child, which would typically refer to an unwanted child. Margit is referred instead as an omen oni, a Japanese spirit often translated as ogre or demon. And with this perspective in mind, they then provided a translation of the sword monument for the second defence of Leyndell, and it reads, In the second Leyndell defence, the omen demon piled up the corpses of heroes. The omen demon, the oni. So in the Japanese it is clearer that the fell omen is seen as something more than a regular omen, that his vengeful nature and power is almost demonic. Perhaps his name, the fell omen, isn't just a reference to him being an omen, but the fact that his appearance is a fell omen. As Loki said, onis are evil demonic beings in Japanese folklore, that in appearance are generally like the omen, hulking ogres with horns. Indeed, we see his ability to appear throughout the lands between at a moment's notice, when he appears outside Stormvale and then later appears outside Lane Dell, stalking us every step of the way whilst not physically being there. I think it is clear that Morgoth is able to manifest himself at will throughout the lands between. As I mentioned in passing earlier, this is clearly a sort of golden magic, as it is very similar to the golden magic found on the Omen Shackles, and it is an extremely impressive display of magic at that. Using his magic in this way, being able to appear multiple times and reappear after he is defeated, really would give the impression of Margit being a vengeful spirit rather than a corporeal being, a karmic response to those who harbour ambition. And no doubt, this is the type of idea and fear that Morgoth is trying to instill with his persona. I really like this detail as we already know from the Fell Omen cloak that Margit is feared, but the linguistic insight from Loki really makes it clear the mythological fear that Margit inspired. To help in his labour, and in a move that would surely have increased Margit's myth, he would employ a unit of hunters, the Hands of the Fell, the Knight's Cavalry. When we defeat Margit for the first time at Stormvale, he vaguely references the Hands of the Fell. I shall remember thee, tarnished, smouldering with thy meager flame. Cower in fear of the night. The Hands of the Fell Omen shall brook thee no quarter. Then of course we get confirmation that Margit is indeed referring to the Knight Cavalry when we finally get their armour set which reads, Pitch black helm with flowing black hair, worn by the Knight's Cavalry who ride funeral steeds. The Knight's Cavalry, who now wander the dim roads of night, were once led by the Fell Omen and were deliverers of death for great warriors, knights and champions. This obviously paints a rather interesting picture, that they were once led directly by the Fell Omen. Trained to kill champions, knights, anyone who harboured ambition for the throne and the Erd Tree, and their worn, blood-stained armour is surely a testament to how many lives they have claimed. I think AJT Jake makes a really interesting observation in his Morgoth lore video, which I will link below, that there are 10 members of the Knight's Cavalry that we face in game. 10 members for 10 fingers, thus making up the Hands of the Fell. Again, another bit of beautiful symbolism that really further lends to their mythological legend and the superstitious fear they and Margit would inspire, and perhaps their very existence would dissuade champions from even trying to claim the Elden Throne. These deadly knights would have only compounded Margit's terrifying legend. Their very appearance is custom designed to invoke an image of death, almost as if they are the Grim Reaper themselves. And again, thanks to Loki, we know this to be the intent of their design due to the original kanji used, and they translated the knight cavalry armour in the following way. The cavalry wandering the highway at night once were led by the omen demon. They are reapers of every warrior, knight and hero. And when referring to the specific kanji used for the term reaper here, Loki said the following. 
Reaper equals Death God, originally referring to a specific Shinto Kami escorting the dead to the afterlife. In modern times, this is equated with the Western Death Grim Reaper. The image of the Night Cavalry as mythological bringers of death is helped along by the very steeds that they ride. In their armour description they are described as funerary steeds. When we kill the Night Cavalry horses, they eventually are resurrected by the Night Cavalry Knight, in which they appear out of a purple portal, and this can happen endlessly throughout the fight until we kill the knights themselves, who are the ones that are able to summon their funerary steeds. These steeds are unlike most creatures in Elden Ring. They aren't like those who live in death, who are resurrected from the ghost flame, whereas these horses are resurrected from a purplish portal. Perhaps these are spirits connected to the spirit world described in the Helfen Steeple Sword, but that is just speculation of course. But perhaps this is why they ride only at night, Perhaps these steeds have a relation to the dark, and can only exist in our world during the hours of night. Either way, the psychological impact is the same. These are dangerous warriors on the back of what seem to be undead horses that appear only at night. They are the reapers of man, again, a karmic response to those who would have the ambition to claim lordship, or so Margaret wants people to believe when in reality they are just another part of Morgoth's many-layered plan to keep the flame of ambition firmly doused. And until we arrive, the Elden Throne does remain unaccosted, whether through fear or brawn or both, and Morgoth's true identity remains veiled. Up to this point, his plan has been a success. But when we do reach the Elden Throne, he does have to throw down with us once and for all, and the surprises don't end when it's revealed to us that the King of Leyendale is the spectre that's been hunting us since Stormvale, as in his fight with us, Morgoth displays some unusual and incredible powers, especially in the second phase of his fight. At the end of his fight, he unleashes some powers that are firmly associated with the Formless Mother. And so in this next chapter, I want to discuss Morgoth's powers and also his relationship to the Formless Mother, and why he appears to be wielding blood flame. Morgoth is an exceptionally powerful being, no doubt one of the most powerful in terms of lore, probably only behind Radan and Melania, and even then not by much. As we touched on earlier, the Godfrey projection that we battle with in the Erdtree Sanctuary also has the same golden magic emblem as the Margit projections, suggesting that Morgoth is responsible for both the Godfrey projection and his Margit manifestations. In past videos, I had also suggested that the Moog projection in the sewer before the Frenzied Flame prescription was also the work of Morgoth, mainly because it fades away in sparkles of gold, much like the Margit projections do, leading me to initially believe that this was just another one of Morgoth's projections alongside Godfrey and his Margit manifestations that it was just another form of his golden magic. There is also the fact that this projection of Moog appears before Morgoth's golden seal that blocks the entrance to the Frenzied Flame prescription, and thus I assumed it was just another barrier, another safeguard. However, I was quite wrong on this, and I am glad to be, as I think the evidence clearly highlights that this is a projection done by Moog himself. Firstly, this phantom doesn't appear with the same crucible seal that we see with the Margit and Godfrey projections. I've put a lot of focus on that in this video, and thus it is a stark difference when we see the Godfrey or Margit projections appear compared with this Moog projection. Instead, this projection appears with a sinister red cloud of blood, much more like the magics of the Lord of Blood. Next, we need to consider that this Moog still appears and still challenges us even if you've killed Morgoth already, and given that the seal behind Moog has disappeared when you kill Morgoth, you'd assume that the Moog projection would also fade after the defeat of Morgoth. Finally, in what I believe to be the most compelling bit of evidence, the Moog shackle works on this projection. The magical shackle is tuned to Moog specifically, so surely it would only work here, 
if this is actually Moog, if it's an aspect of him. This is an interesting revelation because it means that in a way, Moog is assisting his brother in sealing the frenzied flame. But this does make sense because despite their mirrored views and aims, the frenzied flame would be as damaging to Moog's plans as they would be for Morgoth's. Everyone is united against the frenzied flame. Aside from those impressive powers of projections, Morgoth is also able to manifest weapons at will, including swords, hammers and throwing daggers, that he can use to devastating effect, catching his enemies off guard with their sudden manifestation. The fact he is able to use these powers even when he is projecting himself as Margit across great distances is truly impressive, but his real power is obviously revealed when we face him in person, when he unleashes entire storms of these golden weapons. And given all we've said about Morgoth's golden magic when it comes to projections, it's clear that these weapon projections are an extension or derivation of those same powers. Instead of manifesting a copy of himself or a phantom of Godfrey, he is manifesting a copy of a sword, a hammer or dagger. Truly Morgoth is the grace given as we do not see a greater display of grace aligned magics anywhere else in the game. But his use of these magics all makes sense. Morgoth is aligned to the Erd Tree and Grace, hence he uses golden magic. He also has innate power as a demigod, and combined with his great rune, it is easy to see how Morgoth wields such incredible powers. However, these are all very clean abilities. He doesn't really utilise his omen powers as his brother does, or the regal omens do in the sewers. That is until we push him to the very edge and his omen blood is released and his omen powers with it. And as we see from Morgoth's dialogue at this moment, he is utterly shocked and ashamed at this turn of events. The thrones, stained by my curse, such shame I cannot bear. Thy part in this shall not be forgiven. The unleashing of his omen blood that he has been conditioned to hate, and yet this doesn't stop him from trying to use the powers unleashed with his omen blood to try and stop us. He has nothing to lose at this stage and hates us even more in our part in forcing his cursed blood out and staining the sanctity of the thrones. We see that he has similar powers to that of other omen, such as wreathing his sword in the wraith flame and his omen blood becoming pretty volatile and this can all be explained as his omen related powers. However, the more interesting aspect of his second phase fight is the certain moves of his that are wreathed in a red flame, what's known as the blood flame. And these powers are identical to the blood flame incantations, those powers associated with the formless mother and utilized more frequently by Moog, Lord of Blood. For example, some of Morgoth's red slashes in stage 2 wreathe his sword in the red blood flame, identical to some of Moog's attacks, where we see him spilling the blood flame all over the floor, or throwing at us to try and zone us. And Morgoth's slash attacks while empowered with the blood flame leaves the same lingering red lines that Moog's blood flame talons attacks do as well really firmly confirming that the attacks that Morgoth is using in stage 2 that wreath his sword in a red hue are tied to the formless mother. So how and why is Morgoth using the power here? Morgoth has never had anything to do with the formless mother and he is strongly staunch in his support of the Erd Tree and would never betray it to serve the formless mother. So to answer this question we need to look at the formless mother itself what it is and how it interacts with the world. The Formless Mother is one of the beings known as an outer god, as we learn via Mogwin's sacred spear, which reads, as well as serving as a weapon, it is an instrument of communion with an outer god who bestows power upon accursed blood. The Mother of Truth desires a wound. I did a full video on the nature of the outer gods and I would highly recommend that. But to summarise, I brought in noted translator Mirko, translator for the Italian Souls channel Sabako no Meiku, and they were kind enough to give their perspectives from the Japanese lore community on what the Outer Gods are. Mirko shared that in the Japanese lore community, 
they believe that outer gods are more akin to kami, a concept from Shintoism, and to quote Wikipedia, they can be elements of the landscape, forces of nature, or beings and the qualities that these beings express. Kami are not separate from nature, but are of nature, possessing positive and negative, and good and evil characteristics. So according to this theory, the outer gods are manifestations of elements, nature, and emotions that would have risen out of the disparity emerging in the aftermath of the fracturing of the One Great, in the same way that Chaos Gods manifest in the warp in Warhammer lore. I'm very proud of that video and the perspective that it brought to Western audiences, but one mistake I made, I think, upon reflection, was trying to say that because the Outer God were likely to be Kami, i.e. reflections and manifestations of different elements and emotions, that they couldn't be what the West perceived them as, as cosmic beings. When in reality, I think both can be true, and this was a nuance pointed out by various viewers. Much like the Chaos Gods of Warhammer, such a being, whether or not they are manifestations of an emotion or nature, are also clearly cosmic in level. And so that is my final word on the Outer God. They are Kami, manifestations of certain elements within the world, but they are cosmic level beings. And they are Outer, Outer Gods, because each of the Outer Gods represent an element that is currently outside the established order. And if you'd like a more in-depth discussion on these finer points, I would recommend my Outer God lore video. Regardless, what is clear is that the Outer God is a consciousness that is tied to blood, viscera, and wounding. We learn via the Blood Boon incantation and the Mogwin Spear that this being craves wounds. And this makes sense when we consider the medium that the Outer God interacts with is blood, and thus more wounds spreads more blood, and thus the influence of this Outer God spreads. This is why the areas in which the Formless Mother's influence is greatest are areas that are flooded with blood, such as the Rose Church and the Mogwin Palace Grounds. This is the Formless Mother's chosen medium of power and communication, so it makes sense that when Moog first interacted or communed with the Formless Mother, she communicated with him through his own blood. For the Blood Boon item description reads, The Mother of Truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement he was born into. Again we see how the Mother of Truth can interact with blood, and specifically is able to ignite Moog's blood, and this is why he easily wields the blood flame. His own accursed blood is ignited. This distinction of Moog's blood literally being ignited, and that this fuels his greater omen powers, is an idea explored by Crunchy in their Crucible video, which I highly recommend and I will link below. Indeed, Moog's blood incantations that he wields with great ferocity are described as blood flame, and unmistakably Morgoth uses blood flame in his second stage with us. So this brings us back to the original question, how and why is Morgoth, a stalwart defender of grace, the mirror opposite of his brother, wielding the same powers as his brother, who is a servant of the Formless Mother. Well, firstly, I think it thematically fits in with another demigod, who has tried to resist their nature, but in a moment of stress, during combat, no longer has the will to resist it, and unleashes it in the heat of battle. I am of course referring to Melania, the chosen vessel for the Scarlet Rot, another medium of a different outer god, and Melania has spent her life, alongside her brother Mikola, trying to control and suppress this element within her. And there is definitely a parallel here to be made between Morgoth and Melania. Morgoth has also tried to control his omen nature, decanting his own blood into his sword to lessen the curse within him. Yet despite Melania's courageous efforts to resist her nature and the scarlet rot within her, during her conflict with Radan, and later us, she unleashes the Scarlet Raw and blooms, and I think something similar is happening here to Morgoth. We are pushing him right to the edge in a ferocious combat, and in a moment of stress, whatever will he is using to keep his omen blood within him, keep his curse within him, is completely unleashed, 
to an extent that we don't actually see any other omen displaying. Aside from Moog, of course, who is more in touch with his omen abilities and uses them in a far more controlled, but no less destructive manner. Moog's usage of his omen powers and his blood powers are that of a master, someone who has taken years to master the power within him. Morgoth's usage is far more raw. We see a swampy layer of omen blood fill the arena, exploding in geysers. And Moog's transformation in his second stage is a deliberate act where he saps our energy, our blood, to embolden himself and give himself massive, impressive wings. Compare this to Morgoth's transformation, which seems more like someone losing control, breaking down under the stress of a superior opponent. And as such, his use of his omen powers of his blood are more raw and uncontrolled. It's clear from what we know about Morgoth as a character that he wouldn't choose to connect or make a covenant with the Formless Mother on purpose. Rather, I see it as a reaction. The Formless Mother is the God of Blood. And here we have a massive deluge of a cursed blood, the most powerful blood in the lands between. No wonder the Outer God manages to get a slight foothold here. And in Morgoth's desperation to defeat us, he is clearly drawing on a power he doesn't fully understand, but he doesn't care. His shame is too much to bear, and he must destroy us to regain some sort of honour. I do think there is some finer nuance here to be had, however, as the Formless Mother goes by another name, the Mother of Truth. What truth, though? Well, I think Crunchy in his Crucible lore video tackles the question in a really interesting way, and I would highly recommend that video, which I will link below. In this video, Crunchy, having consulted with translators Last Protagonist and Casative, examined the Japanese version of the text in regards to the references to the word truth, the kanji used for the word truth, found in the Blood Boon incantation and Mogwin's Sacred Spear. Crunchy points out that there are many words for truth in Japanese, and in this particular case, the kanji used for the Mother of Truth is the one for the truth of a situation or a narrative. I find this interesting when we consider that the Mother of Truth's main source of power is blood. And what is more evidential of the truth of who you are than your own blood? Upon the release of Morgoth's blood, the truth of who he is, of his form, is revealed to him in a visceral manner. There is no truer material than blood. Blood is part of our form and cannot be denied. Morgoth is very aware that he is an omen. He has never tried to deny that or suppress that truth. However, he has tried to suppress his omen aspects, his omen powers, and his omen nature. And yet, that counts for very little in this moment when his omen blood is spilled out across the arena. And in this moment of desperation, in the moment where his shame could go no further, he finally embraces his omen powers, wreathing his sword in omen flame, a far cry from his golden swords that he has been using up to this point. Perhaps this is what is meant by the Mother of Truth. That is of course my wild speculation, and what it ultimately all comes down to, whether you believe me or not, is that in this moment Morgoth loses all of his reserve, any boundaries he had left, because of the incredible shame we pile upon him. He is embarrassed by the turn of events, and we must be killed in order to regain his honour to a degree. But this isn't true, of course. This is just a view he has had foisted upon him by the Golden Order. Terms used to describe the omen like vile or despicable or despised are all just terms from a certain viewpoint. All that really matters is that the omen are powerful beings with incredible strength within their blood. That is really the truth, but it isn't the truth that Morgoth died for. Morgoth had been conditioned to protect those who would see him imprisoned or worse and he has been conditioned to hate his very own flesh. On top of this, if I am right, he did it all for a false mission, another pawn in Radigan's game, who has increasingly shown that he will do anything, even deny the greater will, just to hold on to the crumbling remnants of his precious golden order. And that isn't to say that Morgoth is a fool, who knows what you would believe if you were in his situation. And while it may seem baffling to us that he would accept the word 
of his oppressors. His position on his own omen form actually does very little to disparage his incredible achievements. He defended Laidel and its mainly innocent victims from years of war, and in a world gone mad, Morgoth is one of the only beings who seems to have it together. And no matter what you think about his beliefs and misplaced allegiance, he is stalwart in his ideals, and he stands in defence of them to the bitter end. As such, he is respected in a rare way for a From Software game, getting an almost funeral-like scene, as the mightiest man in the Lands Between, the greatest legend to have walked the Lands Between, gently cradles him and puts his son to a well-deserved rest. And ultimately, perhaps I am wrong about Morgoth being tricked by Radigan. There does seem to be some visual evidence that the Greater Will is pitting players against one another, to make sure that the strongest and most worthy succeed. As pointed out to me by a commenter, when Godfrey puts Morgoth to rest and he fades into gold dust, a Guidance of Grace line seems to appear to Godfrey and points to us, the Tarnished. Godfrey's intent is clear, he wishes to become Elden Lord again and stand before the Elden Ring, and it seems as though in this scene that the Greater Will is encouraging him to try and defeat us, that his Guidance of Grace guides us into a conflict with us. Yet at the same time, the Guidance of Grace has also delivered us to this point as well, so it clearly wants us to battle to determine who is the most fit Elden Lord. Perhaps Morgoth is grace given because he was guided by grace, rather than it being a bestowed title. Perhaps he knew all along that it wasn't the Greater Will who barred the entrance to the Erd Tree, but instead he was still guided to act the way he did, that he was to act as the last defender of the Erd Tree, to be a crucible, a test, in the Greater Will's great game to determine who should become Elden Lord. And if that is the case, then Morgoth's mission was a success, as there is no greater barrier on our journey, and if we cannot overcome Morgoth, then we simply are not worthy to lead the next age. So thanks guys, that is my take on the grace-given lord, king of Leyendale, last of all kings, Morgoth. I know he's a lot of people's favourite character, so I hope I did him justice. When I started this video, I didn't really think it would be as long, but again, I was wrong, and Elden Ring constantly proves that it has so much nuance beneath the surface. If you like this video, then please consider liking and subscribing to the channel, as I have hours of Elden Ring lore content for lorehounds. In the comments, let me know if you think I was wrong, if I was right, and what you'd like me to cover next. But until next time, guys, I will see you in the chambers of the Sovereign Alliance. Take care, and have a wonderful night.